Good morning. It's great to see each and every one of you here today. We're excited to be together to worship our Heavenly Father. And as we are together, we do want to do just that. We want to worship. And so we're going to sing praises to our Heavenly Father. We're going to quote scripture. We're going to recite truth. We're going to hear from God's word. And we do all of these things for God's glory and for his glory alone and that we would grow. And so again, welcome. We're, thank you, we're thankful that you are here. I want to dive right into the scriptures this morning. I want to take you to Ezekiel 34. I'm only going to read a few verses in verse, uh, in chap, uh, starting with verse 20 as the motorcycles go by. Um, but if you can hear, therefore says the Lord, thus says the Lord God to them, behold, I, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you push with side and shoulder and thrust all the week with your horns till you have scattered them abroad. The Lord says, I will rescue. He says, I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be a prey and I will judge between sheep and sheep and I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. What we see in that passage is a prophecy where God states that he is going to shepherd his flock, that he will return to Israel, that he will draw Israel in, and that through David, through David's line, he is going to send a good shepherd. We're here to worship the good shepherd today. Would you, uh, would you pray with me before we start singing? Uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you again for allowing us to be in your house. And Lord, as we are here, we recognize that we have an opportunity to worship. We have an opportunity to sing, an opportunity to pray. And fathers, you've blessed us with all of these opportunities. We do recognize that there are many of our brothers and sisters around the world that cannot freely do what we're doing here. Lord, we pray for them. We pray that you give boldness, that you would continue to bless and encourage them, that you would strengthen them. Lord, I pray for those among us that can't be with us today due to sickness or other reasons. Lord, I pray that you would continue to reach them and care for them and draw us together to be one family and in one place so we can worship together again soon. Uh, Lord, we we think of all the violence and things that are going on around our nation. We think of the things that are going on, especially the invasion in Ukraine. Uh, Father, we see that there's disruption and discouragement and dismay all around us. But Lord, as we are here, we are a people of your flock. We know you as our shepherd. And Father, we know that you are in control, that you are still sovereign, that you are still active, and that you love us. And it's because of your love that we worship you now. Father, lead us to be more like your son as a result of everything that is done in this place. For it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us stand together and begin our time of worship and song this morning. Worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His power and His love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. O tell of his might, O sing of his grace, Whose robe is the light, whose canopy space, Great chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, And dark is his path on the wings of the storm. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain. 
and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end. Our Maker, Defender, Redeemer, and Friend. Amen. We are reminded that our Shepherd is our Redeemer and that we worship Him as the King. He is the King. But we also know that in His kingliness that we are simply to have faith in him, and we gain the benefits from that, which is uh, something that is beyond imagining. But let us continue singing of what we can do by faith. By faith we see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design. In the lives of those who prove his faithfulness, who walk by faith and not by sight. By faith our fathers roamed the earth with the power of his promise in their hearts of a holy city built by God's own hand. A place where peace and justice reign. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward. Till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. By faith the prophet saw a day When the longed-for Messiah would appear With the power to break the chains of sin and death And rise triumphant from the grave By faith the church was called to go in the power of the Spirit to the lost, to deliver captives and to preach good news in every corner of the earth. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward. Till the race is finished and the work is done, we'll walk by faith and not by sight. By faith this mountain shall be moved, and the power of the gospel shall prevail. For we know in Christ all things are possible For all who call upon His name We will stand as children of the promise We will fix our eyes on Him, our soul's reward Till the race is finished and the work is done We'll walk by faith and not by sight. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward. Till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. Please be seated. 
You know, that, that song is, uh, depending on how you call it, a contemporary hymn, whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter. It is, I think, one of the best things of what it is to work by faith and that faith isn't something of the modern church. It's something from creation that all of God's people from Israel to now have been called to walk by faith and not by sight. And that is how we are empowered to do what we do, not because we're smart, not because we go and get seminary trained, not because we go and, and get a skill set from this, that, or the other thing or titles or whatever else, but because we have faith and in that faith, we are empowered by the spirit to go and do the work of God. And that is a blessed thing that we have. But I just, yeah. Uh, but I just want to take a moment to welcome everyone here today that it's a blessing to come together and worship our Lord and Savior, to worship our shepherd, to show our faith in our Lord. And it is always a blessing to come together. If you are maybe new with us, visiting us for the first time, maybe the first time in a long time, uh, in the back of all of the seats, we have welcome cards. We'd love uh, for you to fill that out so that we can know how we can best serve you, uh, even if you're just here on vacation or if you're looking for a new church home. If you wouldn't mind filling that out, you can drop it in the offering plate or hand it to myself or Pastor Dennis outside at the Welcome Center after the service or give it to one of the deacons. We'd love to know how we can best serve you. In the back of all the seats, we also have a prayer request card. If you have any kind of prayer requests, we invite you to fill that out again because we are a praying church. We want to be praying for big, big things, small things. We want to be praying for concerns. We want to be praying and praising with you for praises. We know that there's a lot of both of those going on and in our church, on our island, and throughout our world right now. Uh, so again, you can fill that out, drop it in the offering plate, bring it out to us, give it to a deacon. If you forget to do one of those things, you can just email myself or Pastor Dennis uh, during the week. We'd love to be praying with you and for you and all of the things going on in your life. And for anyone that may be watching us on the stream or maybe watching after the fact, these links are in the uh details, description, whatever it's called. Uh, and we'd love for you to fill those out as well. We'd love to know that you are with us online somewhere. But as we come together, we know that when we come before God, we worship him because he is God. We worship him for who he is. And as we fully realize who he is, we confess of our sins and realize our need for a savior. And in that today, we will be uh, reading responsively Psalm 23 and remembering the ministry of Christ. The Lord is our shepherd. He shall not want. He makes us lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside still waters. He restores our souls. He leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though we walk in the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. For he is with us, his rod and staff. They comfort us. He prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. He anoints our heads with oil. Our cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you that you have called us here together. We thank you that you have offered this sacrifice of your son, that, that we are not here drawing near because we did the right thing, because we made a sacrifice, because we said the right words, but instead we are here to draw near to you through the blood of the lamb, through the sacrifice of your son, Lord, and we thank you for that. We, we think of, of all of the promises throughout the Old Testament that point to Christ, and, and we thank you for the ministry that we have of Christ as we are reminded in Psalm 23, and I just pray that as we continue to worship today that we remember that in part we get to confess to you because we are sheep that go astray and we continue to go astray and yet you the good shepherd continues to call us back lord and i just pray that in this worship today we remember who you are and we remember the promises of you as our shepherd lord we thank you and praise you for all of these things in your heavenly name we pray amen let us stand together and continue our time of worship and song
Savior, like a shepherd, lead us, much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us, for our use thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine, we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine, we are. We are thine, do thou be friends. Us be the guardian of our way. Keep thy flock from sin, defend us. Seek us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, O oh, hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Thou hast promised to receive us, poor and sinful though we be. Thou hast mercy to relieve us, grace to cleanse and power to free. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to thee. Early let us seek thy favor, early let us do thy will. Blessed Lord and Holy Savior, with thy love our beings fill. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, loved us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, loved us still. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest thought, thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever shall be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, and moon and stars in their courses above, join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. 
Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and the peace that endureth, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by I see all I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Amen. We are reminded in songs like that of God's faithfulness, and we are reminded continually throughout Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, that God has sent us a shepherd, that Christ is our shepherd, that Christ is the good shepherd. And this morning, let us read from or hear from Micah 5, verses 4, and the beginning of verse 5. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth and he shall be their peace. We know that we are secure in Christ. We have peace in Christ. Christ is our shepherd, and Christ is our salvation. Brothers and sisters in Christ, hear this morning that in Christ your sins are forgiven you. pray that it's acceptable. We pray, Lord, that it would be honoring to you. And uh, as we come to that portion of our service where we return a portion that you've given us, Lord, we pray that uh, you would be honored by it as well. We pray that it would further your kingdom, that it would glorify you. And uh, Lord, that uh, by this simple act of worship, Lord, that, uh, that we might be blessed as well. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. The King of love, my shepherd is, whose goodness failed it never. I nothing lack if I am his, and he is mine forever. Never failing, ruler of my heart, everlasting, lover of my soul, on the mountain high, or in the valley the king of love my shepherd is the king of love my shepherd is where streams of living water flow my ransomed soul he leadeth and where the verdant pastures grow and food celestial feedeth never failing Ruler of my heart, everlasting. Lover of my soul, on the mountain high, or in the valley low. The king of love, my shepherd is. The king of love, my shepherd is. Never failing. Ruler of my heart, everlasting. Lover of my soul on the mountain high or in the valley low, the 
king of love my shepherd is the king of love my shepherd is I'm going to ask children, if you have your parents' permission, you may follow Miss Rachel up to Children's Church. Again, children, if you have your parents' permission, you may follow Miss Rachel up to Children's Church. Now, uh, before we jump into the Word and we we pray, I do want to share with you, uh, many of you know that uh, on June 14th, Rachel was scheduled to have a pretty in-depth surgery. Uh, And I just want to share a quick praise with you that she had an appointment this week and the doctors determined that the issue that that I guess necessitated surgery is no longer an issue, uh, that whatever was there is no longer there. So praise the Lord for that. And so God as our good shepherd continues to bless and care for us. If you would, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we jump into this morning's message. Father, I do pray that as we are together that we hear your word. And Father, as, as such, I pray that you would move me out of the way and just let your voice be heard. Uh, Father, that as we hear your truth, that we would apply it to our lives and that our, our hearts would be changed as a result of what we understand in your word. And Father, I pray that as we grow, that you would forgive us for the many ways in which we fail you. Father, that you would lead us to be more like your son, that you would lead us to know and to follow the voice of our shepherd. And so, Father, would you be honored and pleased with the study that we engage in over these next few moments together, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. I want to start by asking a question, so this is interactive. Uh, I want to see a show of hands. How many of you have ever gone golfing or played golf or attempted to play golf? Uh, I would call what I do attempting to play golf or what I've done. I haven't played golf since we moved to Hawaii. Uh, but I, I heard this story, and it, it deals with golf. Uh, there was a, an, an older golfer who went to, the, went to the course. It was a new course. He'd never been there before. But as he stood on the very first tee, he uh, got ready to go, and he looked out, and the green is a par three. Uh, and so he was looking at the green, and he realized that the green is surrounded by water. And he had a shiny new golf ball. And so he got nervous because he's, he's worried about losing his new golf ball. Uh, m- maybe you don't have that problem, but I do. I see the water and I think there's a lost ball. Uh, but he looked at the water and he got nervous. So he decided, I don't want to lose my new golf ball. I'm going to take the old golf ball and I'm going to use that. And so he put the old golf ball on the tee. He addressed the ball just as he was about to take his backswing. He heard a voice that told him, use the new ball. So he was fearful, but he thought, I'm not going to disobey this booming voice. And so he switched out the ball. He grabbed the old ball and, and, and put it in his pocket, and he put the new ball on the tee, stood up, addressed the ball, was ready to take his backswing, and he heard a voice again. This time the voice said, take a practice swing. And so he decided, okay, I'll do that. So he backed up, and he took a practice swing, and he decided, I'm feeling pretty good about this. So he stood up to the ball, addressed the ball, was ready to take his back swing, and he heard the voice a third time, and this time it said, just use the old ball. And uh, now I, I think we hear things like that, and, and while it's lighthearted, and, and I hope it's funny to you, um, if not, I apologize, it's the only time you'll have to hear that story, but, uh, but as we hear things like that, it reminds us, how often do we feel like we're getting mixed signals? You know, use the new ball, swing first, use the old ball instead. How many times do we feel like we're, we're following what we're being told, or we think we know what we're being told, but now we're just confused? The question I want to ask as we work through our our time in the Word together is, uh, what voice, whose voice are we listening to? 
You see, later in John chapter 10, we're going to read verses 1 through 18, but later in chapter 10, Jesus says, My sheep hear and know my voice. Now, he says that in the passage we're going to read, but he revisits that later, reminding those around that those who are his know him. Those who are his, they hear his voice, and they can pick up the sound of his voice, and they follow it. So we have to ask ourselves as we get started today, whose voice are we following? Because throughout the Gospel of John, he presents Jesus in in a beautiful contrast. And as, even as Jesus speaks, he presents himself in contrast to, uh, with himself as the good shepherd, in contrast with those who are the Pharisees, or as Jesus points out in our text for today, the false shepherds, or even the wolves. And so there's this beautiful uh, contrast that's going on throughout the gospel, that we see Jesus as the true shepherd, as the good shepherd, and we see Jesus as the Son of God. And now today as we're looking at this, I'm going to ask you if you would open with me in your Bibles to John chapter 10. But as we're looking at this, I want us to see how Jesus is presented in this text while asking ourselves throughout, whose voice are we truly following? So today we're going to focus on verses 11 through 18, though I want to read uh, starting in verse 1 so that we see the, the, the discourse that Jesus begins uh, starting in verse 1, and he carries that throughout. As we read, I want you to see that Jesus is building on a metaphor and that he builds that metaphor up to the point that he finally presents himself as the good shepherd. So if you have your Bibles, again, John chapter 10, verses 1 through 18, if you do not have a Bible, if you would let us know that out at the welcome cart uh, at the end of the service, we can get a Bible to you. We would love to give one a way that you can take and study for yourself, but whether at your seat or on the screen, if you would, let's look to the Word of God together. Here we see Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him. For they do not know the voice of strangers. John says, this figure of speech Jesus used with them. But they did not understand what he was saying. So verse 7, he digs a little deeper into this metaphor as he says, So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And what we see here is Jesus started off by talking about sheep and sheepfolds and shepherds. And then when they don't understand what he's talking about, he doubles down and he says, I'm the door. We were talking about the door that the sheep come in and go out. Jesus says, I am that door. It's an exclusive statement. There's no way to get into the sheepfold legitimately unless you go through him, through the door. He says anybody that jumps in over the walls or anybody that tries to come in any way but through the door is nothing but a thief and a robber. But Jesus says, I am the door. I open up and allow the sheep to enter. I open up and allow the sheep to go out and find pasture. But now, starting in verse 11, he digs even deeper into this metaphor. Listen to what he says. Verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. Okay, so dropping the imagery of the door and the the sheep, he now says, I am the good shepherd. Verse 11, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them up and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 16, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. 
He says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them in also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. And so what we see in this passage is Jesus explaining to the Pharisees, he's having this conversation with the Pharisees, and he says, look, you know sheep, you understand the the difference between uh, sheep that are just running wild and the sheep that have a shepherd. They come in and out through the sheep pen. And then he says, you guys aren't understanding what I'm saying, so let me tell you, I am the door. I open and allow the sheep to come in and go out. Still, they're not getting it. And he says, I am the good shepherd. I lead the sheep. I care for the sheep. I lay down my life, and I pick it up again. I will bring them together to form one flock and one, with one shepherd. And so this is the conversation that he's having throughout uh, chapter 10, at least the first part of chapter 10. Uh, But in order to catch more of the context surrounding this passage and understanding why Jesus went into this discussion to begin with, we do need to return back to chapter 9 because Jesus is having a conversation with the Pharisees. You see, Jesus healed physical blindness in such a way that he was highlighting spiritual blindness. Let me say that again. Jesus healed physical blindness in order to highlight spiritual blindness blindness. So if you're not familiar, in John chapter 10, Jesus heals a man that was born blind. He, throughout his entire life, never had the use of his eyes. He was born blind. And after this man was healed, he went out, was healed, he came back in, no longer seated at the gate, no longer begging, but he came into the temple to worship with the other Jews. When he returned into the temple, he began to be uh, peppered with questions about what happened, how he could see, who did this to him, who helped him. And and in order to make a, a long story short, after being questioned two different times by the Pharisees and even having his own parents questioned by the Pharisees, this man became frustrated. He was confused as to why they're asking so many questions. And so he said, why are you asking me all these things about this man? Why are you asking me about the works that he does? Do you guys want to be his followers? Well, that frustrated the Pharisees. And they said, no, we are followers of Moses. We follow Moses. This man, we don't even know where he came from. In chapter 9, John records that this man responded in this way. He said, why? This is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. He said, never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. This is the man born blind talking to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees responded to him by saying, you were born in utter sin and you're going to teach us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. Now what the man said was right, but the Pharisees were angry with what this man was saying. Instead of hearing what the man said and saying, you know what, you're exactly right. We're going to repent of this, we're going to apologize, we're going to go and sit under this man's teaching and, and understand more about who he is. They showed no humility at all. Instead, they showed pride and anger by kicking him out of the synagogue. I'm willing to submit to you that they were not so much angry as they were scared. And because of their fear, they acted impulsively and threw him out. Uh, This man recognized, that, and rightly so, that there is someone, namely Jesus, who has a greater truth than what these Pharisees are sharing. Uh, someone who seems to have more power, somebody who seems to know God more deeply, somebody who appears to be closer to God than these Pharisees were. This man has found Jesus and he recognizes there is something different about this man. There is something that sets him apart, and I believe the Pharisees recognize that. 
I believe that the Pharisees were afraid of losing power or influence. This man named Jesus was being seen as someone who could do the works of God with the power of God, all while claiming to have the same authority of God. If people began to follow this man, if people began to follow Jesus and listen to the things that Jesus was sharing with them, then the Pharisees would not be able to control the people anymore. You see, these religious leaders knew that they might lose their position of power and influence if others came to know and follow this man named Jesus, who was doing things that they could not explain. Now remember, these are the religious leaders. These are the most studied uh, studied men in all of Israel. They should have seen what Jesus was doing and recognized this absolutely is the Messiah. This is the man we've all been waiting for, but instead they were afraid of him. And at many different times, they tried to kill him. So instead of embracing and trusting in the Messiah that they claimed to have been waiting for, they simply tried to silence the truth by throwing the man out of the synagogue and threatening to do the same with anyone who confessed Jesus as the Son of God. Now, upon seeing this man outside of the temple, the man healed of blindness confessed Jesus as Lord, He saw Jesus, he confessed that he is Lord, he fell down and worshipped him. Jesus began to share with him that he had come in order that the blind may see and those who see might become blind. Now, if you're familiar with this story, you know the Jews and the, the religious leaders heard this conversation and they scoffed at this. In fact, they actually asked Jesus, are you saying we're blind Are you saying we're the blind ones? That's what leads Jesus into this discussion. Now, we have people all throughout our country, all around us in our society who who will tell you, I know the truth. I have the answers to the purpose of life. I have the answers to where life comes from. But what they're doing is they're peddling a truth that's not really true. And what they're doing is they're pushing these ideas that are not found in Scripture, that do not come from God, And they're they're manipulating people with those truths. We, as the true sheep of God, need to recognize the difference between those voices. We can't allow ourselves, like that golfer, to hear different voices or to hear voices telling us different things and become confused. Because we're not just playing a game of golf. Uh, We're trying to follow Christ and be godly. And uh, we need to lead others to do the same. So what Jesus does is he shares with him that there's this difference between those who are physically blind and those who are spiritually blind. R.C. Sproul explains it this way. He says, those who falsely imagine they have special insight into the things of God become blind opponents of God's ways. And those who seem less informed are able to see when the Spirit of God opens their eyes and leads them to faith. When people are spiritually blind, though physically sighted, the truth that their eyes are taking in is not perceived by their hearts. That describes what was going on with the Pharisees. I pray that that does not describe what happens to us here today, that we would recognize the truth, that we would see it and receive it. Okay, and that's what we need to understand because Jesus is explaining this difference between false shepherds and good shepherds. And he's helping those that were there to understand there's quite a difference between what Jesus is saying and what he's leading people to do versus what the Pharisees were saying and what they were leading others to do. So I point out this bit of context so we can understand we are in no better position in our world as we continue to have people telling us what we deserve, what we ought to have, and how often we ought to have it. Okay, But we need to push out the false voices, and we need to listen for the voice of God. Pointing out chapter 9 really helps us to realize the stark contrast that Jesus is presenting at this point in John's gospel. On the one hand, you have the blind Pharisees who are making a living off of the, essentially being the blind who lead the blind, pretending to give sight but only keeping others in darkness. You see, the Pharisees had aligned themselves with the very law that was meant to be a schoolmaster or a teacher of our need for a Savior, but they focused so much on what was to teach them of a Savior that they missed out on recognizing the Savior. 
So on the one hand, you have these blind Pharisees who are keeping others blind because they're not leading them to the truth. But on the other hand, you have Christ, who is the good shepherd, who brings light and life and gives sight to the blind. You see, it is Christ who aligned himself with the descriptions that we find in the Old Testament. The descriptions of a promised shepherd in places like Ezekiel 34, or how he uh, perfectly fulfills the role of the good shepherd in the beloved 23rd Psalm, which we worked through in our responsive reading this morning. Now, I want to share with you some notes from the English Standard Version's study Bible. It says this, that in the Old Testament, God as the true shepherd is contrasted with unfaithful shepherds who will be judged by him. We see this in places like Psalm 23, Isaiah 40, Jeremiah 23, Ezekiel 34, Zechariah 11, as well as here in John chapter 10. Now, we also see that David, or the Davidic Messiah, uh, is also depicted as a good shepherd. We see this on display in 2 Samuel 5, um, the 78th Psalm. We also see Ezekiel 37, and then even the, the passage that Pastor Caleb read just before the message uh, in Micah chapter 5. But we also see Moses as a type of a shepherd and how he led the Israelites and how he led them out of Egypt and, and led them through the wilderness. But even he is to point us forward to the greater shepherd in Christ. But we see Moses as he's presented in places like Isaiah 63 and Psalm 77, where we see Moses is depicted as a good shepherd. But we know that Jesus came, and Jesus being both man and God is the complete fulfillment of both of those themes. We see that he is not only a true shepherd, but he is the good shepherd. So we have to ask, do we see the difference that's being uh, portrayed here between the power-hungry Pharisees and the humble servant shepherd of Jesus? Uh, I want to state it this way. The good shepherd will guide, protect, and feed his sheep. But it is the false shepherds to whom Jesus was referring that may have had physical sight, but they suffered from spiritual blindness, and they simply aren't devoted to the sheep. Jesus refers to them as both thieves and robbers. He also refers to them at times as wolves. In the final analysis, we see that the true false shepherds, rather, that the false shepherds use the sheep for their own gain. They lead sheep only so far as it suits their own greed. They, like the hired hand, protect themselves before they protect the sheep. Like the hired hand, they're willing to sacrifice the sheep if it means saving their own skin. They will sacrifice the sheep by throwing them to the wolves in order to make an escape and find a new set of sheep that they can do the same thing to. Rather than feeding the sheep, they feed on the sheep. So who are we listening to? Are we listening to the false shepherds of this world? Are we listening to the wolves? And sometimes wolves show up wearing shepherd's clothes. We need to be able to discern what's true and follow the true voice of God. And so we need to follow the voices, uh, or excuse me, the voice that we see in Scripture as, as God leads us rather than the voices of those seeking to lead us astray and away from the fold. So I want us to look at two very key things that we see in verses 11 through 18. Two key things that Jesus does as the good shepherd. The first thing we see here is that the good shepherd, Jesus says in John 10, verse 11, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. William Barclay, talking about this particular passage, wrote, Jesus was the good shepherd who so loved his sheep that for their safety he would risk and one day give his own life. Now, as we talk about the good shepherd, we have to understand that in the Greek language, there were two different words that were used for good. The first word for good is agathos, which speaks of a general moral uprightness, uh, a general um, you know, being above rebuke. Okay, and so we, we know this general goodness. Uh, it, that was the first word, but it is the second word, kalos, that Jesus used here. You see, kalos is a Greek word translated as good, but that word denotes 
while tied to the idea of a moral uprightness, it, in, it expands on that by saying there is a beauty or an excellence found in this goodness. It is an attractiveness in this goodness. See, it's not just goodness for goodness sake, but it's a goodness that draws others in to share in that goodness. Uh, I, I don't think this is the best analogy, uh, but, you know, we all know those bug zappers, right? Those lights that when you turn that light on, it just draws the bugs in. I'm not saying that we're bugs, but we do understand the drawing effect that light has, right? So Jesus is attractive in that, not that he's going to bring us in and zap us, but that he brings us in and does the opposite. He draws us in and gives us life. And so we understand that the good shepherd is attractive in his goodness, not in his face, not in his body, but rather in his spirit, in his core. What makes him who he is draws us to him. An old writer once shared talking about the ability to be morally upright. He once, uh, this man once wrote, it is possible to be morally upright repulsively. Okay, now, maybe you know somebody like that who they, they follow the books, or they, they follow the rules, they do everything by the book, but man, they are tough to be around. Yes, they are above board, but man, they have a harsh personality. It is possible for us to be morally upright and repulse people. Um, Jesus does the opposite. He is morally upright. He is good, but he draws folks in that they may see him as the excellent, lovely, attractive, good shepherd to whom all others pale in comparison. Seeing Jesus as the good shepherd ought to give comfort to every single Christian because as a follower of Christ, we enjoy a personal relationship as that of a sheep in the most wonderful and trustworthy shepherd's flock. Whatever valleys, dark valleys, treacherous mountains, or hazardous wilderness we have to traverse in this life, we can do so always knowing as followers of Christ, we can always know and trust that we are the sheep of God's pasture and that God's own Son is watching over us. He's guiding us. He's protecting us. And when we speak of protection, and he, when he lays down his life for us, he's offering us the greatest protection there is. He's protecting us. He's saving us from the wrath of God. You see, to be in the good shepherd's fold is to be free from condemnation and assured life with the Father. To be outside of the fold of God is to be in utter darkness. I want us to look back to chapter 10, uh, verse 18. Uh, John 10, verse 18 says this, No one takes it, that is his life. No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. When Jesus says that he lays it down of his own accord, what that means is the Jews did not murder him in the sense that we understand. He willingly allowed himself to be killed. They did not do anything to thwart God's plan. In fact, in their evil desire, God providentially worked through their decision to have him killed in such a way that God's glory was made manifest, that God's glory was magnified in the evil hearts of those seeking to kill Jesus. He says, I lay down my life of my own accord. He says, no one takes it from me. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to pick it up again. This is what sets him apart from all other shepherds. The fact that the good shepherd can lay his life down on behalf of the sheep and take it up again. King David is well known as a good shepherd. If you're familiar with the early years of David when he spent time as a shepherd, we know that he fought off a lion, that he fought off a bear with his own, with his, no pun intended, but his own bare hands. And he fought off these beasts and risked his life willingly to care for his sheep. He was a good shepherd that he willingly risked his life for the sheep. Jesus, however, is the good shepherd. Jesus is not just a good shepherd and a long line of good shepherds. No, he is the good shepherd because he willingly gave, not just risked, he willingly gave his life for his sheep. But then he took it up again and raised from the dead. You and I can only thank Christ for the salvation that we have. Because if it were not for what Jesus did on the cross and willingly laying his life down for us, if it was not for the action of our good shepherd, we would have no hope in this 
life. So you and I ought to thank Christ for our salvation while others might have had a hand in leading you to Jesus or to the Good Shepherd. Only the Good Shepherd truly gave you life. Only Christ can truly give life because He laid His life down. The second thing that we see is that the Good Shepherd gathers His sheep into one flock with one shepherd. This is going to be a bit repetitive as we go through, but I want us to remember this as we leave out of here, that there is only one flock of God, and there is only one shepherd of that flock. Jesus tells us this in verse 16 of chapter 10. He says, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. What he's talking about are the Gentiles. He's talking to the fold of God in Israel, and he's saying, I have other sheep that are not part of this fold. They're out there. I'm going to go and get those sheep, and I'm going to bring them in. He says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Again, the other sheep here, the the Gentiles outside the fold of Israel, uh, these are the Gentiles who would believe in Christ. He's talking about the fold of God not being all of Israel, but those of Israel who believe in him, who confess him as Messiah. That is the flock that he is building. But here in John 10, verse 16, this is one of a few different indicators within the Gospels that a new body of people would join Israel as the people of God in the future. We see this explained a bit further in John 17, but it's clarified even more by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians, both chapter 2 and chapter 3. But these two flocks come together to form one flock. The Gentiles, along with those from Israel, compose one flock, namely the church. We see this explained in detail in 1 Corinthians 10. By saying this, Jesus is ruling out the possibility that there could be two different churches, that there would be a Jewish church and that there would be a Christian church. With God, there's only one flock. There are only believers and non-believers. So Jesus is building this new flock, and he's bringing them together, and he's declaring that this new flock will have one shepherd, namely himself, Christ, as the head of the church, Jesus knew these other sheep outside of the fold he's talking to. He knew them, the Gentiles, just as well as he knew those who would confess him from within Israel. This is why we say that the gospel who brings us together in Christ, the gospel is the only answer to the unrest that we as humans are facing in this world. I want you to hear what one commentator shares about the gospel. He says, No other power can remove the hatred between nations and men than the grace of God in Christ Jesus. Only in Christ can we overcome the divisions of race, class, and nationality. And our union, and I hope you know this to be true today, that our union as Christians, the union of love that we share, is one of the greatest blessings that believers can now enjoy. All Christians, this writer says, all Christians have the same Lord. And it's important that we point out, he's saying all Christians. This is not all believers. These are all those who trust in Christ as their Savior. There are many people who say, oh, I believe in God. They're not talking about the same God we are. There is only one shepherd, and it's Jesus. When he says, I am the door, that is an exclusive statement. That is the first of many exclusive statements where Jesus will eventually go on to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's even more than just saying there's a door that opens and you can come in. He says, no, you have to go through me to be with the Father. So what we see is that we as Christians, those who are following Christ, have the same Lord and Savior in Jesus and the same God as our Father. We have been redeemed from the same condemnation of sin and have all gained forgiveness at the foot of the same cross. He goes on to say, all believers are joined in one flock with one good shepherd, and we all partake of similar trials and hardships in this life, but all Christians are destined for the same eternal glory that God has promised. What a privilege it is for us to experience this unity now together in the church. So as the good shepherd 
lays down his life for the sheep and protects us from the greatest threat to our lives, and that is sin and the consequences of sin, that is God's wrath coming upon us. He not only lays down his life to give us life, but he draws us together to bring together one flock with one shepherd. What a joy it is to know the good shepherd. We shared this earlier, but I just want to share with you, knowing the good shepherd means we know one who provides for us so that we have no need. One who makes us to lie down in green pastures and leads us to still waters. One who restores our souls, who leads us in paths of righteousness. Despite having to walk through valleys with the shadow of death, we know that it is because of our good shepherd that we can walk without fear because he is with us, because his rod and staff, they protect us, they comfort us. We know that our good shepherd prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. We can sit down and have a meal with no fear of what's going on around us because of who our shepherd is, knowing that nothing is going to happen to us that he hasn't allowed, and trusting that if it happens, it's because he allowed it and because he has a plan to work through it. So again, he prepares a table before us in the, t- in the presence of our enemies, but he also anoints our head with oil and he allows our cup to overflow. Because of our good shepherd, we can know goodness and mercy all the days of our lives and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And again, I say what a joy it is to know the good shepherd. Now, I must tell you that in this life, we will, be, or we will continue to be surrounded by false shepherds and those who seek to harm us. Now, Jesus has called under shepherds to care for his sheep. I put this picture up. I found this picture online, and I think it's a beautiful picture of sheep just without a care in the world, just hanging out on the side of a, of a mountain, or a, I guess you would call that a hill, um, or uh, just a, a rising. Uh, but there's sheep there, and they're just relaxing, enjoying the pasture. And as I look at this picture, my first thought was, what a beautiful image of God's protection over us. But then as I look at this and I see, I I don't see any shepherds that are captured in this picture. In reality, the shepherds had to have been off the side and they weren't the focal point of the cameraman. Uh, But as these sheep are around, we have to remember, even in the times that we're allowed to go out to these green pastures, we must be aware there are those around us who would love nothing more than to destroy the peace and the hope that we have. Today, just as in Christ's day, there are wolves who seek to devour the sheep by leading them astray, by cutting them off from the rest of the fold and attacking when an opportunity might arise. You see, there are pretenders, that is fal- that are, those are false she- uh, shepherds who lie about the sheep, who lie to the sheep, who manipulate the sheep. They silence any who might question their teachings. And if there's anything that might come out that could potentially make them look bad or even wrong in their teaching, it is quickly and emphatically denounced by these false shepherds And that person or those sheep are removed from any form of spotlight in order to protect the false shepherd's brand. Why is that? It's because the false shepherd's brand always matters more to to those false shepherds than the very sheep they were supposedly called to lead. I want to shift your attention to current day issues because we recognize that there are a lot of uh, problems that uh, are uh, going on around us. Now, many of you have heard of the Sexual Abuse Task Force of the Southern Baptist Convention that was formed uh, as a result of a vote of messengers at last year's annual meeting. Uh, That task force uh, brought in a group called Guidepost Solutions to put together a report to do an independent third-party study or investigation into allegations of abuse within the Southern Baptist Convention and the handling of those allegations by the executive committee. If you get our emails, I I shared a response, so I'm not going to give a full response here, but I want to point out something that in that report, we recognize that there are many Southern Baptist leaders who are accused of allegedly using their power or their 
uh, position or their authority or even their influence to silence allegations, uh, specifically those allegations that might somehow reflect poorly on the convention, and also silencing those things that might, if they were made known, they may increase the legal liability that the convention has. If you're familiar with this report, you've seen absolutely devastating details within the report, and it is incumbent upon us, members of a local church, to persevere by doing what is right. That if we at the local church level will do what is right, not hide from difficult conversations, not dismiss allegations of abuse, but handle them in a biblical manner, then we will continue to let that go up through the other channels of the Southern Baptist Convention to where if we all are doing what we're supposed to do, we will begin electing leaders who will do what they're supposed to do because we've been developing leaders who do what they're supposed to do. But I'm pointing this out because there are some men who unfortunately slipped into a position where they stopped focusing on the sheep. They stopped caring about the sheep and they started caring more about image and about the name on the sign outside. We have to be careful because we do recognize that the report gives accusations that clearly there are some men who are reported to have engaged in wolf-like behavior by preying on the very sheep they were called to serve. Now, each one of those has a responsibility to share the facts and to prove what really happened. But in either case, we see either a lack of accountability or a lack of transparency or some form of both led to disastrous results. As I say all of that, I want to be very clear. Given the nature of the Southern Baptist Convention, the executive committee of the Southern Baptist Convention is not in a truly authoritative position over churches. We are an autonomous local church. That means we guard and shepherd and lead ourselves. We don't have a hierarchy within the Southern Baptist Convention that tells us how to worship or what to worship, but rather we make those decisions on our own. I point out this report because while the focus is on the executive committee and their response, what we're really seeing is there are a number of pastors who did not have the right amount of accountability in their lives. They had the responsibility to shepherd well, And I point them out to remind us and and let it be a reminder to us always just how easy it is for us to slide into behavior and actions that mark false shepherds. We can easily slip into behavior that protects ourselves rather than the ones that God has called us to care for. James tells us that true religion is this, that which visits the orphans and widows in their affliction and remains unstained from the world. We have to remain unstained. Okay? We have to continue to care for those who are hurting, care for those who cannot care for themselves. But I want to share with you, you and I are always only one step away from sliding down a slippery slope toward harmful behavior. That is why we need consistent accountability. That is why we need to know the voice of the shepherd and follow his voice. If you're here today and you're listening and you know his voice, my charge to you is to follow it well. If you say, you know what, I'm I'm a believer. I know my shepherd. Then follow him. Follow him well and do what he has commanded you to do. If you've never called upon him as Savior before, I would encourage you to consider your sin and to hear the voice of the shepherd promising to forgive you and make you whole. Turn to him and follow him into the fold. We started today by asking whose voice are you listening to? Are you following the voice of the good shepherd? Are you following some other voice? Maybe you're just wandering aimlessly, not listening to any voice. I would encourage you with this story. Uh, there's a, I read this. It's a story that was shared by Tim Challies. It, it actually comes from uh, Istanbul in Turkey in 2005. There's a story of a huge flock of sheep, thousands of sheep, that were seemingly left unattended by their shepherds, and they wandered and got themselves into a heap of trouble. Um, That's a southern phrase. Uh, In 2005, hundreds of sheep followed their leader. There was one sheep that was standing on the edge of a cliff. It was a 50-foot cliff. There was one sheep standing on the edge. He must have made himself the leader of the sheep that day because the shepherds were off doing their own thing. And that one sheep decided to jump off the cliff. And he did. And he jumped off and fell 50 feet and died. 
And then 450 other sheep jumped after him, and they all fell off the cliff, and they all died. Very interesting. As the uh, shepherds, as I said, they left them to just do their own thing. The shepherds went to go get breakfast, and they left their sheep thinking they're not dumb enough to jump off the cliff. They were dumb enough to jump off the cliff. In fact, after those 450 sheep jumped off and died, another 1,100 jumped off the cliff as well. Now, they survived. They survived because if you can imagine, the shepherds see this cliff and they see their sheep jumping. Imagine the giant pile of fluffy woolen bodies that broke the fall of all of these other sheep. So 1,100 sheep jumped off. They bounced off the wool of the others, and they managed to survive their really dumb mistake. You and I may not always be so fortunate. Okay? Just because we see one sheep do something dumb, we don't need to jump off. It's like our mothers always told us, if your friend jumps off a bridge, are you going to jump off with them? The obvious answer is no. We need to follow the voice of the shepherd. There may be times when we don't feel the presence of the shepherd. We don't recognize that the shepherd is around us. That is not an excuse for us to go off and do whatever we feel like doing. We know what the good sheep do. We remain in the fold of the shepherd. Even if we can't see or hear or sense his presence, we need to continue to do what Scripture has commanded us to do, that we ought to be good sheep. You and I, we we must know the danger of not following the good shepherd. As we close out today, I would remind you the best way to follow the voice of the good shepherd is to spend time being in his word. Uh, Spend time being among his people, being on your knees in prayer to the Good Shepherd. We must be devoted to canceling out the voices of the pretenders. Uh, we often, I've often said this, it's not original to me, but we often say we're talking about hearing the voice of God, and, and somebody more famous than I once said, if you want to hear the voice of God, read Scripture. If you want to hear the voice of God out loud, read out loud. Okay, we need to get our, our uh, selves back into studying the word and following the good shepherd. Doing so will allow us to cancel out the voices of the false shepherds, but it will also allow us to recognize Jesus as the son, as the good shepherd. If you would, let's pray together. Father, we come to you now. We thank you for giving us this time together in your word. And Father, we ask that as we are together, Lord, that we would be able to apply this truth to our lives, that we would understand and that we would remember that your son has given us life by laying his life down, that your son has given us the assurance of an eternity with you by drawing us into his fold, that together all Christians from all nations throughout all time form together one flock and we know who the one shepherd is. Lord, if there's any here who would say this morning, I've never trusted in Jesus, I've never called upon him, would today be the day that we recognize the weight of our sin and our need for a Savior and turn our hearts to Jesus. Father, if there's any here that say, I've already trusted in Jesus, but we've been hanging out on the fringes of the sheepfold, that we're hanging out, not getting in the mix, not being involved, but just kind of being there, And that's all. Father, would you remind us to use the gifts, the talents, and the abilities that you have blessed us with to continue building the flock, to continue encouraging the other sheep. Father, wherever we stand this morning, would you help us to stand in a way that we respond well to your word? For it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you if you would please stand with me. We're going to take a moment and sing a song of response. And as we sing this song, I want to encourage you that if you have something that you would like to pray about, if you have a question you would like to ask, would you come forward in response as we sing together? Maybe you're saying, you know what, I've, I've been coming and I've been attending for a long time, but I've never, I've never gotten involved. I haven't joined a Sunday school class. I haven't joined the church in general. I haven't been a part of the ministries or the missions of this church. Come forward and we can give you resources, or whether now or after, we can meet outside and we can share what what God is allowing us to do together. But in whatever case, wherever you're standing, would you respond as we sing this morning? Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. 
There's light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Amen. Please be seated. Again, we want to thank you for joining us for worship today. I want to share, if this is your very first Sunday with us, welcome. We're thankful that you are here. We have a welcome center outside. And uh, after we finish up in here, if you would like to get more information about the church or resources about what we offer and what we're doing here as a church, I would love to get to meet with you and talk story. We have a small gift we'd like to give you out there. So again, thank you for joining with us for worship today. I do have a few. Uh, very brief announcements for you. Uh, I want to share with you that uh, in in the bulletin you can see that the youth pool party is coming up. That is coming up on Saturday, June 18th. As that is coming, please look at that bulletin announcement because there is a limit. There's a maximum number of those that can go to the pool party. So that sheepfold has a very firm limit. God's sheepfold is unlimited. Remember that. Um, But um, familiarize yourself with that. If you have questions, reach out to Cassie, and and she'll get you all the information that you need. Vacation Bible School is coming up, and we're excited about that. Vacation Bible School will be at the end of this month, the last week of this month. There are sign-up sheets. There there was a a great work day yesterday where a lot of prep was done, and uh, it's looking great. We're excited about all that God is doing and what he will do through Vacation Bible School. But if you're interested in serving, there is a sign-up sheet in the back and we'd encourage you to sign up and and reach out to Rachel for more information just as a reminder on Thursday morning this week Thursday morning we will uh, gather at the Mackay Chapel of Milani Mortuary for Joyce Watadabi's uh, funeral service and so uh, remember that is coming up this Thursday at 9 a.m. again that'll be at the Mackay Chapel if you have questions let us know. One last, two last announcements, excuse me. Uh, tonight, uh, at the end of our evening service, we will take up the Lord's Supper. All are invited to join us as we remember the Lord's Supper uh, tonight. That'll Again, it'll be in our evening service this month. It'll be again in the morning service at the beginning of next month. But again, tonight, 615 is when our evening service begins. The last announcement for you is if you are not currently attending a Sunday school class, I'm going to ask if you would, if you're interested, we have a map and we can give you all the information about the various Sunday school classes that we have available. I want to let you know that if you're not currently attending a Sunday school class, there are great classes available. We meet from 930 to 1030 ish every Sunday morning and so uh, as there are opportunities there it is a great way to build community with others within the church get to meet some folks from the new service uh, excuse me the early service as well but if you have questions about Sunday school or questions about the church in general meet with us outside at the welcome center and we'll answer all the questions that you have if you would let's stand together as we close with one final chorus Share his love by telling what the Lord has done for you. Share his love by sharing of your faith. And show the world that Jesus Christ is real to you every moment, every day. 
Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us go and walk with our shepherd.